Don Meek, thank you so much for being here. I'm uh, super stoked. It's super fun. It's a pleasure. It's super cool. What a great opportunity for us to chat. And we were just riffing on, again, and you mentioned it, and it, I want to use that video or the recording that you just had a TED Talk in Lagoon Beach. So we're going to set the stage of some of the stuff that you've done, and we're going to get into it. But I mean, ultimately, we're here for my passion project where I get to talk to really cool people that do really cool stuff and ideally connect the dots. And you're the perfect example of like what's kind of fun for me is I've known your name for a long time. And if you're a surfer, not saying that everybody that watches is because this is not a surf podcast, but if you're a surfer, you know of, you may not know of you, but you're aware of things that you've touched in many different ways. And there's a lot that you've done both in and around the industry. And we're going to kind of dig into all of that. Cool. Love it. Super fun. Thanks. Super Mark. stoked. Oh, I'm super stoked. Um, what's also funny is that we, and we'll talk more about this later too, but we ran into each other not too long at a, at a great event in the Newport Aquatic Center, the We Are Ocean fundraiser, which was kind of an imposter syndrome night for me because of- Was it really? Well, just, it was growing up as a surf kid here in town with the industry. It was like an industry who's who. Like I was, everybody was there. We'll talk more about it, but it's, that's where we last saw each other before this. And this is just super fun for me to kind of be able to dig deeper. Because again, and we were just having coffee, you were sharing some more insights that will and history that we'll talk about, but we're gonna connect the dots, the Don Meek dots, if that's cool. That's great, Rad. love it, thanks. So I read a quote, and this touch, touches on the, the surf piece, and there's way more that I'll talk about in a second, but as way of an intro, I'm gonna start with this little quote, okay. and then we'll go in, and then we'll start chatting, and I'll <laughs> shut up and let you start. <laughs> so I thought this was really, really neat. Again, this is on the surf side, which is just one bit, one layer of the Don Meek. So a lifelong surfer, deeply passionate about the history and culture of surfing, and is committed to preserving it for future generations. And I was like, for me, that's just one little excerpt. And I don't even remember where that was from. Mm. I'm guessing it was from board riders or something that you're involved in, which we'll speak about. But for me, that's, my, that's one of my many passions. History of surf, we, had Craig, we were talking, we had Craig Lockwood mm. in here, and um, anybody that's passionate about it, I, like I want, I want that story. So it should be really cool. Yeah, so I, found surfing um, when I was 10 or 11 years old. And I, it was, I was not good at any of the stick and ball sports. And it was not until my mom put me in swimming when I was eight. Mm. And I'm like, oh, I can do this. And then I grew up in Palos Verdes. And so- Well, we're gonna get, let's oh. get in, we're gonna get in all that. But Sorry. I was, no, no, don't no. apologize. This is just me. So the, 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 the history and so, be, Surfing was the thing for me, and I started reading Surfer Magazine in 1967 or 1968, and it's and it has stayed with me. Yeah, let's stop there because it is because and what's fun is jump all the way ahead to today, and sure. you're still super active in it and super maybe from a passionate perspective, you're right in the middle of it. We were talking a little bit about mm. it. We'll talk a lot about the board riders and what you guys just had last weekend. Um, really, really neat. But there's more. Okay, introduction wise, <laughs> and this is where I get to kind of brag about you. So. All right, you've been, so we're just gonna, I'm gonna run through the list and then we can, then we'll start talking and asking big questions. So you've been, or are currently, you've been a media executive, a brand executive, mm -hmm. a revenue executive. Mm -hmm. You've been a director or board advisor. You've been, you're definitely a creative to some degree, or, and there's been some innovation in there and you've got some stuff here we'll talk about that you're working with, not mm -hmm. saying that you innovated it, but you and your current business that you're working in are pushing on stuff like this, which is rad. You have worked in TV, print, events, tech, sales, and you've worked with or for or under some of the biggest brands like Sony Pictures, Prime Media Action Sports, Tribune, Fuel TV, you're still working there, and now Atlantic Packaging and the New Earth Project. Like, mm. okay, I've worked for one company for 30 years, and you've worked, I mean, the amount of stuff, and what's really neat about it, and I look forward to learning more about how, because there's a lot of interrelation there. You would go, gosh, a lot of those are not related, but the way you've done it, whether by design or haphazard, they all seem to interlink or you've made them interlink over the years. So we're gonna get there. Okay. Okay, now I get to ask some questions and we will come back to all of this, I promise. We'll, we will talk career at length because there's a lot of really, really neat stuff in there. But let's start at the beginning. You started telling, you started, you had mentioned Laguna. You mentioned to me earlier that you were a lifeguard here in Newport. Didn't know that. First question, 
if you don't mind asking or mind answering, how old are you? I'm 66. Which blew my mind. You told me that I would have, I would have guessed you were probably 15 years younger than that. Oh, aren't you nice? Thank you. Uh, dead serious. Super fit, good looking dude. Um, but so let's take that history wise. Where'd you grow up? Tell us a bit about your history, family, et cetera. Fourth generation Californian. I was oh, wow. born in the Bay Area in Berkeley. My folks met at Cal. My dad grew up in San Francisco. My mom grew up in the East Bay. Um, my dad took a job at Bethlehem Steel. We moved to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania for six months and then moved straight back to Southern California. And I was uh, raised in Palos Verdes. Did dad say, this is not for us? Is that why you guys moved he, back? He said, we are going back to <laughs> back California. To <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Got it back to Cali. Yeah. And you guys, so, but from Berkeley, you went out six and then came months, back. Six came, months and then we came back. And so uh, from the time I was a year and a half, I was in Palos Verdes. In PV. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. What was growing up in PV like? The best. Why? Um, well, I look, I mean, we knew it was good then. It was, uh, the beach was five minutes away. Um, we lived in a place that still felt pretty removed from Southern California. Very, it wasn't rural necessarily, but a lot of wildlife and a lot of canyons and things to explore as a kid, um, super safe and a great community to grow up in. And then, I, like I said, I started surfing when I was 10 or 11, and it was a great place to be a surfer in the 70s. I can only imagine. I mean, what's really amazing, and it's almost, you know, what I always say is, here we are in Newport Beach, Costa Mesa area, mm. and you live in Laguna. Yeah. It used to be Newport Beach, Laguna, Irvine, and this is representative of the whole coast of California. They were all separate little towns. Now, oh, they're, yeah. all, now they're all connected. Yeah. And Palos Verdes used to be, because you're up on the hill and you're, but you're only a couple miles from downtown LA and from like, you come off the hill and you're in the middle of it all, Torrance and everything else. But up on that hill, seems like you were very far removed. Yeah, yeah. And you, you felt removed. Um, we've, it, did, it was very idyllic to, to grow up there. And I, and I knew it then, and I, but I look back on it now with e even fonder memories and about how lucky we were. Well, I haven't spent a lot of time in PV, but we used to do a lot of prone races up there and yeah. I've done some mountain biking. All I can say is I still, every time I'm there, I get lost driving around trying to get off the hill. <laughs> <laughs> I've never figured it out. It's always been smarter than me. But I've done a lot of paddling up there and we, we talked about a guy named Joe Bart, mm. the premier prone paddleboard guy for the last 40 years. And you said that you grew up with him uh, with his yeah, family. Yeah, yeah. So his, bro his older brother, Matt, and I played water polo together. His dad, Larry, taught me how to swim, actually. Amazing. Um, and Andy Bark, his, his brother, um, that whole Bark family, his sister. But yeah, I've known Joe since he was a little kid and he was always a waterman. I remember Joe making fishing poles in the garage when he was probably 10 or 11 years old. Yeah, his hand, he knows how to make stuff. Yeah, he does. What's funny is, again, I'm jumping all over, but my first Catalina Classic was in 1996 and I have a board that he made probably in 80, we've talked about it, he and I have talked about it probably in late mid eighties mm. and it's gonna become a wall hanger soon, but I paddled that, I mean, it's still on the side of the house. It, it's a tank, we would never wanna paddle that thing, but it's pretty rad, it kinda goes back, kinda harkens back to a little bit more primitive prone paddling surf days. And up there must have been very kind of wild. The ocean up there is very different than living in, in Newport where it's one straight coastline. I mean, PV is known for really fun surf all kinds of surf and free diving and a lot of things. I would. Yeah, assume. there was a whole waterman thing. We didn't call it that, but we were all in it all the time back when we were kids growing up. Yeah. So die. I mean, the guy that lived next door to us growing up, he was a LA city lifeguard and a waterman and he would come home with burlap sacks full of yeah. lobsters from going diving after work and we would have a lobster barbecue in the back. Yeah, it was cool. That's so cool. What a different world. There's no abalone. Hard to find now. Oh, mm. Laguna's looking pretty good. Oh, yeah. Shh. So <laughs> secrets out. Well, the Marine Preserve down there, uh, I think it's been 10 or 12 years and it actually, it worked. So I swim up there all the time and you, you'll be stoked when you see what's down oh, there. Oh, that's good to hear. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. Um, so keep going. So you guys are living in PV. Mm. You were playing polo. What else? You started surfing when you were about 10. Mm -hmm. What was life like? It was great. You know, it was a, a very normal childhood. Um, my mom came home. I was in junior lifeguards and loved that uh, in the summertime. 
And she came home one day and she said, do you know that those lifeguards can make $2,000 in the summer? And that was all the money in the world. I'm like, what? And I wanted a surfboard and, and you know, it was great, but if we wanted extra stuff, we had to work for it. And, and so I figured out that LA County would take you when you were 18, but Newport would take you when you were 16. Mm -hmm. So I sussed it out, got the application, signed up, came down, tried out, made it into in-service training and got hired that summer I was 16. But how? So you were living in PV. Mm, yeah, it was only an hour if you think about it, Mark. Back then, it was a... Uh, Coast was, Highway. No, the freeway. The freeway? Yeah, so I'd get off at Brooker Street. So I worked um, between the Newport Pier and the River Jetties and what's Division One. I. I think it probably still is Division yeah. One. So I could leave my house if I had an 8 o'clock tower. I could leave the house at 7 and be at the tower at 8. Back what, then... What would that take you today? Oh my gosh, it could take two hours. Yeah. Yeah, it was... And I, gas was... We were making four ten an hour when the minimum wage is a dollar sixty five, so it was a really good summer job, and gas was thirty five or forty cents a gallon, so it was great. Well, you what's that, that's amazing. I it, it didn't occur to me that you would be able to live up there and work down here because it was much more, you know, it was it was doable. Today, well, and, you and and you know the. My parents were like, hey, you got this job. Good for you. And I did it all on my own. That was yeah. the pretty cool thing. But then I'd end up go to a party and get and like they were cool if I didn't come home yeah. for a couple nights in a row. So you'd stay over at it's somebody's a different house. World today, it, was, huh? it was very different. Yeah. Good for you. How cool. Um, you know, I guarded I guarded Newport for one year and then decided that wasn't for me as much as I enjoyed being at the beach. But mm. I remember being in the towers and it would say you know, money for, it was like one of the songs from the eighties, like money for nothing and chicks for free. And it was like a, you made good money today. The lifeguard services all over are struggling to get people because it hasn't kept up with inflation and everything else. And they're making the, 17 bucks an hour as, as lifeguards. It's the most, it, it is the most undervalued, underappreciated job in the world. You know, I can sit here without without reservation and say, I know categorically that I saved people's lives, that if I had not been there, they would have died. And that's what those guys do. And girls do that every single day. And the fact that we pay them 17 bucks an hour today is, right. Staggering. is shameful. Yep. We had a Drosco, uh, Bogdog was in here and he's got something called the Lifeguard Project, which is shining a light on lifeguarding for mm. exactly this reason. Mm. And he's affiliated with the Van Carlson Foundation. Mm. Because this is becoming, it's not just apparent, it is now being a big, big problem because hiring has become, you know, like that was the most sought after position when I was a kid. Like it was, you had to qualify and work super hard to get a lifeguard job. Now they're begging for people, which is a travesty. So. It's just, it's so hard for me to believe because I, I know what it took back then. Yeah. I mean, it was wild. And then the competition for the job, you had the Newport Harbor guys, you had the Corona Del Mar guys. We had a few PV guys that came down and tried out. We had LA County already had been hired at LA County and they wanted to work in Newport. So it was, yeah, yeah. it was a whole different deal. The whole world, we can talk about how no, surface no. change, we'll get there too. Yeah, I mean, we can. super interesting how things kind of evolve or devolve. Um, so you, which high school were you at? Palos Verdes. Got it. And then, so you're 16, you're guarding college was that the plan did you know it was the plan it was always sort of yeah you're going to go to to college of course you're going to go to college both my parents went to college and so it was part of not the only plan. college they went to berkeley right yeah but it was a different deal back in the day yeah when my dad this is a funny story so my dad went to saint ignatius high school in san francisco and he always worked up in lake tahoe in the summertime and so on his way up to the lake to work that summer, he thought, oh, I should probably go to college in the fall. So he pulls into Berkeley, goes to the registrar's office, and he said it was like a bank teller window. And he shows up with his transcripts and he says, I think I'd like to go to school here in the fall. And the admissions person goes, great, let me see your transcripts. And he had gone to this Catholic high school and gotten good grades. And she goes, great, you're in, $15 uh, to secure your spot and stamped his paper. And then he was up to the lake for the summer and that's how he got into Cal. Oh my God, can you imagine? <laughs> That's the, as much the antithesis as what it takes today. Like, I can't even. No, it's yeah. unbelievable. What's ironic is my uncle is just retiring from St. Ignatius in San Francisco. Mm. And my nephew, cousin, um, went there and played sports. A, that's a great sports feeder team. Yes. In fact, Charlie Goldenson was in this chair and we talked about that. And he went on to be a, he's a stud. He was in the White House, just a stud. So, oh, wow. but it all started at, at that school. Small world. Who yep. knew? Yeah, who, who knew? knew? Um, so college for you was, did you go? So I did. I went to, uh, I went to Boulder 
mm -hmm. for a year and a half and then was over it. I was done. I, I thought I was going to go to Australia and because I had met a bunch of those guys competing and they, yeah, mate, come on down. We'll get you a job. And um, I was done with school. I was going to go to Australia and live, get a job and figure it out, go surfing for a couple of years. And I couldn't get a visa because I had no money. Mm -hmm. So they wanted $2,000 in the bank and a return ticket. And I'm like, that was all the money in the world. And so um, my grandmother had set aside a little college fund for me. And so I was able to go to school at Franklin College in Switzerland for, uh, uh, for six months, for a semester. Rad. I, it was unreal. And then I took... A Hold on, what was the allure and how did that come about? A good friend of mine, Steve Vance, had gone there as an exchange student the semester before and he came back and said, it is unreal. And so my options are continue going to school and go to, because I wanted to travel, and go to Switzerland and do it or go have to get a job. And, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I thought, oh, I'm going to go to Switzerland and go to school. That sounds pretty good. So I was able to do that. And um, was that all just skiing and studying? And no, no, it, it was a lot of... It was great um, in Lugano. It's right there north of Milan, right on the Italian border. So I took five classes. I had um, Art of the Italian Renaissance, the uh, seminar course on the European Economic Communities, mm. uh, 20th Century European Lit, Photography, and then this class called Marx, Lenin, and Mao, where we learned about the communist doctrine. And this is 1978. So think about that yeah, for yeah. a second. It's the height of the Cold War. And academic travel was a big part of the Franklin curriculum. And so the academic travel trip in February that year was to go to Prague. And so we went for 10 days to Prague with the greatest instructor, teacher, guide, Theo Brenner. It was a life-changing experience to, to land in Prague in 1978. And the Iron Curtain was fully in place. And, uh, and to experience that as an 19, 20-year-old kid, it was great. So... I love that. I, I talk a lot about, and I tell my kids all the time, like I've got two in college, one sold home, but I'm like, you guys go abroad and don't come back until class starts. Don't like my son was going to go to Europe for a while and then come back and hang out in New York. I was like, no, 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 go. Just don't come back. Stay as long as you possibly can when you can, because you'll learn more in that amount of time than you'll learn in a year or two or three at school. Guaranteed. Completely. Like it's the best agree. experience in the world. Completely agree. Right. Yeah. What was the experience what did you take away from, or, or what has stuck with you? Or what, what was the formative part of that trip for you? Because it sounds like it was. Um, I think getting over there and realizing that the kids that I was going to school with that, who were from all over the world knew more about the United States than I knew. They knew more language. I spoke Spanish, but they spoke four languages, five languages. There was this idea that there was a much bigger world in California, and it's really what set me on this, okay, there's a, there's a world out there to see. Um, that's probably what lit the fuse for me. And has, that's great. Has, I mean, what a gift to oh. A, recognize it, and B, have the opportunity to go, and then what has that meant to the rest of your life? I mean, we're, we're gonna get back to this, but I'm just super curious. Like, what has, has travel been a big, or international engagement, like, What's, what has been the long-term impact of that? I have had an international component to almost every job I've had in my career, where there's been some, something that's happened outside the United States that I have been involved with. And it's meant a, a, lot, of tra a lot of business travel. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, it's, it's been it's really so interesting. It's so good to get out of here, wherever here is. Like you got to go and there's so much more to the world and you go and you're like, you just realize there's so much more going on than what's going on at home. And to your point, like when you, when you're an American and you typically, like me, I, I speak one language, mm. questionable how good, a, how well I speak it. Um, <laughs> but you meet people, like you said, they speak four languages, they travel. All, I mean, you can, you can travel all over Europe and they're all different languages. And it's just an incredible exposure to the world that you don't get if you don't go. And, and I will also say this, when you come home, you realize how truly blessed we are to live here. I, I have been all over the world for, and it's been awesome. And this is the greatest country in the world. Yeah, well said. And then you get to go to home, home to Laguna Beach, which is, I compare that to Monaco, you, you pick anywhere. Laguna probably either wins or comes awfully close. It's awfully close. Off. I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, we live in one of the destination places on the planet 
got to get out and enjoy and appreciate it. And just, you know, you got it. You got to take advantage of what we have right here. So I'm part of this um, workout crew Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We meet at seven in the morning at Heisler Park. We work, we, we breathe, we do a little mobility, we work out, and then we jump in the ocean. And the guy that leads it is a really great friend of mine named Raya Arthur. And he and I were talking the other day about like, what do you want this to become? And as we were talking about it, I thought, you know, we have to share with the crew, like guys, don't take this for granted. When you think about what we get a chance to do, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, this is one of the most unique experiences that you could ever have, and we get to do it all the time. And so it's like, don't take this stuff for granted. Hallelujah. We could, we could have a whole podcast just talking about that. Yeah. And the headspace around it and the awareness and the beautiful. I love that. Um, so you do one semester or six months. Yeah, I was over there for one semester, came back, and then I kind of went walkabout. I, I was directionless and really kind of needed to go and figure it out. And then when I got back, I went up to Sun Valley and messed around up there and kind of came home with my tail between my legs. It was a little much for me, I'll be honest with In you. In what way? Uh, you know, it was the late 70s and Sun Valley. There were a lot of drugs and a lot of partying mm -hmm. and a lot of stuff that just I ultimately realized was not where I was at. And so I hauled ass home and posted up at my parents' house. And my dad said, you got to get a job. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get a job. Don't worry about it. So he comes home one day. He goes, I got you a job at the gas station. I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, I got you a job at the gas station. Five bucks an hour cash. I'm like, okay. He goes that or you're out of here. And I'm like, oh, okay. So <laughs> I've never told this story before. So I'm working at Ooh, the Union the 76 okay. gas station. Where? And, uh, what's that? Where is it? Oh, it's at the bottom of Belmonte right there in Torrance. Okay. And it's a seven to noon shift. It's five hours a day, 25 bucks a day in cash. And I had gone from elementary all the way through high school with a guy named Jack Hartley, whose dad was the CEO at Union Oil. Oh, wow. And so he pulls in one day in his black Porsche and he goes, Don Meek, the last guy I ever thought I'd see working at a gas station. I'm like, shit. I think I have to get another job. Hold on. What do you think he meant by that? Oh, you know, like I was class president and I, mm. and I had a, you know, I was, a, uh, I was in sports and I surfed and you know, all of that. He had stuff. higher expectations. And he had higher expectations of me God. than working at a gas station. And I'm like, Whoa, okay. I got to, Okay, what am I going to do now? So I re-enrolled in school. I finished it long. So I went. What did that com did that comment really hit you right between the eyes? Oh, I went straight home, and my mom goes, "What's wrong?" You know, I got home. My mom was there, and she goes, "What's wrong?" I go, "I saw Jack Hartley today, and he said I, I was the last guy that he thought he'd ever see working at a gas station. I have to get a different job." Wow. Yeah, it was power. It was powerful. Yeah. Probably. Did you need it? Um. Or would you have ended up doing that shortly thereafter anyway? You know, I, I, I can't answer the question. I was looking for different jobs. Clearly, I wasn't meant to work at it. I mean, I didn't like working at the gas yeah, yeah, station, yeah. but, you know, it, yeah. it, it was one of those things. And I, it was a great catalyst. So we'll never know, but it did. It so did what happened next? Like the fuse. So then I got a job waiting tables and tending bar at a restaurant up in Palos Verdes, and I got a job lifeguarding at Portuguese Bend. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was lifeguarding during the day and either waiting tables or bartending at night. It's a and very typical lifeguard cycle, right? Yeah, you it was. A lot of it. Absolutely. And then um, I re-enrolled at Long Beach State. Yeah. And so that's what happened that year. What was the focus of school? Uh, marketing communications. I got a degree in public relations. Did you know, was that what you were interested in or was that just a means to an end? I was super interested in it. I had learned enough at that point that there were these things called advertising agencies and it sounded really interesting to me. And a guy that was a regular customer at the restaurant was the head of advertising at the LA Times and I was gonna go intern for him. And there was another guy that was a regular customer and I didn't quite know what he did, but he was the best tipper. You always wanted to get mm -hmm. him at your table. And so one day we're at the bar and, or I was tending bar and those two guys were talking and he goes, Meek, what are you going to do when you get out of school? I said, I'm going to go work for him at the LA times as an intern. And he said, are you going to pay? And he said, so this guy Devaney says to this guy, Don Walden, are you going to pay him? He goes, hell no, I'm not going to pay him. He goes, Hey, come work for me. I'll pay you. I'm like, what do you do? And he said, I've got a television syndication company, which I had no idea what that was. And I looked into it and 
that's what got me into television to start with. So that was 1982. Okay, so let's stop for a second. So you're working at, what restaurant was this at the time? It was time? called the Admiral Risty. Okay. It's no longer there. It's probably like the Brigantine and Tain. Like it it's was one like of the those, Brig, yeah. Or the Chart or something. Exactly, chart house it, exactly yeah. And from a personality or a, like, were you a, were you as, don't take the, like, were you as charismatic as, and well-spoken as you are today? Because to have those relationships with folks and play off of the two different guys, like you must have had some skill in communications and stuff. Have you always kind of possessed that? Yeah, you know, I, I've always, in, I've, I love people and I love the interaction. So I think probably there was a little gift of gab in there. But yeah, it was fun for me, you know? Those two guys are sitting at the bar and I'm ser serving them drinks. Classic. And, yeah, it was great. And so, you, which job did you take? Did you I take took the job working for this guy, Jim Devaney, and he had a little- The TV syndication? The TV syndication business, and then- What were you doing there? Selling television programming to programming. small market television Okay, so this, but this is foreshadowing to some degree. I mean, this is your, this oh, it where was you cut the, your teeth. It was the entry point. Mm -hmm. And so then um, you mentioned the international thing. And so he, he had accompanied Nixon to China in 1972 when they went and opened relations with China. Wow. And Jim had actually worked for NBC and he traded the American sportsman for this thing called Bright China, which was a propaganda TV show that the Chinese had created. And so he was selling that to television stations around the United States. And shortly thereafter, um, this is 1981 or two, um, they had deregulated the FCC. And so if you've ever lived in a small town before cable TV, the way you got your television was on what they called a translator or a repeater station. So if you imagine you live in Boise, or you live in Boise, Idaho, you have your local channel seven, but if you live up in the sticks in Stanley, Idaho, you had to get your television on a small little dinky TV station that would just take that big market signal. Gotcha. So the FCC said, well, you guys in those little markets, you can start to put on your own programming. Mm -hmm. So this is called low power TV. And so Jim is a classic entrepreneur and he had this idea, why don't we buy a bunch of syndicated programming and put a little package of programs together for these little dinky guys and we'll have our own network. And th what I learned is you don't ever want to work for a guy that puts his own name on the network. So he called it the JPD television network for James Patrick Devaney. And I was out there driving the back roads of America, selling this to guys in places like Bruce, Mississippi and Perry, wow. Florida and Ponca city, Oklahoma. Yeah, it was, a, it was pretty wild. But what did, what skills did you learn from that, ex that first experience? Um, I think that was my first real sales gig. So there was a sales component to it. You had to learn the media business. You had to really be able to figure out what's happening in local, but then what's happening in national. So it was a real opportunity to synthesize a bunch of disparate information and come up with a solution for these guys. Um, I remember walking into this one. They, it was either in the basement of a church or in a Radio Shack store. And there was a local live gossip show going on, like a noontime live, and they're talking about small town, Just southern. small town stuff. Yeah, it was great. I mean, it'd be like if you had your own television station in Corona Del Mar. Nobody would want it though. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. So when yep. you were in college, mm -hmm. and you kind of, you may have already answered it, but I don't know. I mean, if, if you had a magic wand, or if I had a magic wand for you in college and said, hey, Don, you can have any job that you want. Like, your, what's your dream job at that time? Could you have, what, what, how would you have answered that, do you think? Like, what would have, at that time, you're going through school, you're going to come out and get a career. What do you think? I thought I wanted to go work in the advertising agency world, like go to a McCann Erickson or something like that. It's like mad, it's, it's post Mad Men, but it's still the, like, it's still a pretty darn good time to be in advertising back then. Pre-internet, like, I think it, it must have been really cool. Really right? awesome. Yeah. And then my best friend's uncle worked for Metro Media. They owned KTTV Channel 11 that had the Dodgers here in mm -hmm. Los Angeles. And I said, yeah, Uncle Larry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go work for an advertising agency. And he goes, why would you wanna be on the side that gets the 15%? Why don't you be on the side that gets the 85%? So the agencies at the time got a 15% commission from the stations for all the advertising that they bought, but the, the stations kept the 85%. Oh. And I'm like, oh yeah, maybe you're right. That's pretty interesting. So that got me down the road of working in Local, so, local ad sales. Got it. And it sounds like you've had good, 
I don't know if at the time it, it would have been mentors, but you've had little inserts of information like, hey, go with the 85, not the 15. Mm. Hey, I'll pay you. You come here. Don't go there. Mm -hmm. like, it, it sounds like you've maybe put yourself in the right positions or you've been open to um, feedback or insights from other people, almost mentoring. And I know that mentoring, we'll talk about it, but it sounds like mentoring is a big part of what you like to do, but it sounds like you had, you, or you at least had some good directional support. Yeah, when I look back on it, there's a lot of synchronicities and an awful lot of right place, right time. And there's been some, you know, there have been some real failures along the way too. So, you know, I don't want, I don't want to paint a picture that it's been nothing but up and to the right. I mean, there have been some, some shocking things that have happened in my career over time. Um, but isn't that but part in a, of... But, uh, yeah, I think you don't get... Right, talk to any pro athlete, any coach, um, any big executive, anybody that's you know, made it, they're gonna go, well, I learned everything from how I, jack how I messed up over there. I mean, you learn from your failures and nobody likes it. Um, I think we've all had them and if you don't, you probably will. But I mean, hopefully you learn from them and it's not, it doesn't kill you along the way, but that slap sometimes can be pretty insightful. It can, yeah. Even though it stinks, right? Nobody likes it. Yeah, but in the end, I'll tell you what, with hindsight and a little bit of distance on it, you go, oh, that was the reason that that happened. I see that now, mm. yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. And so um, we have a mutual friend in Mark Fuel and Fuel, he was here, but also you were on his podcast. and so you guys went really deep into some of the stuff you're doing and really deep in the business. And mm -hmm. I want to keep it a little bit higher. Right. So, but I will refer everybody to go see Mark fuel, see you on the Mark fuel. How do you pronounce his teleologist? I think that's right. I'm not exactly sure, but fuel, knows like I, I stumble over that one, but it's a great podcast. It's a great interview. And you guys really go deep in some of the, the history of your work path, which is really, really good. So I would recommend anybody go there and we'll share that. Um, but I think what I also learned from that podcast is you said that you got fired a few times. I did. Yeah. <laughs> did that experience benefit you in any way or those experiences or did they just hurt? Oh, tremendous benefit. I, I, I mean, you know, in, in, in one instance, it was all on me. Like I see now and I look back, th there was a lot of my career where I always felt like I had to be pushing against something that there was not forward motion unless there was this there Ten needed tension. To, there needed to be sort of friction, an oppositional force to push against whatever, whoever that might be. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, I look back on a lot of the stuff that that transpired and I think now with distance and some time and some work, um, I look at it now. And so the one time that I got fired, I'm like, you know, I look back on it now and there was a different way to, that I could have handled it all. And then another time where I would do it exactly, exactly the same way. Yeah. So maybe an integrity thing that didn't mesh up or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, listen, and, 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 and when you have a problem with everybody, maybe everybody isn't the problem. Well, we always say it's the 80, 20, right? And most things come back to 80, 20. If 80% of our stores are killing it and 20% are having a problem, it's on those 20%. If 80% of the stores are f having a problem, it's on me. Mm, <laughs> I'm yeah. giving bad guidance, a bad program, a bad plan, whatever it may be. Um, I think that it's, it's super interesting also that, and I don't know what years those were, but you know, I worked for my, with my dad for 20 years and his original leadership style back in the eighties was very much the GE style, which is, you know, you're always cycling through the bottom 20%. Okay. The Jack you Welch are, thing. It's, yeah, it's yeah. much more, it was a much more aggressive approach to leadership. Um, it was okay to be more mean and aggressive and rude. Not that my dad was, but it was a much more aggressive time. Now it's a much more collaborative, engaged. Um, everybody wins together a lot, of, not all the time, but I think some of it is just time. And then maturity goes a long way. And we were talking earlier, like I have a very, repetitive approach of looking at things that you remember your best and worst coaches or teachers, mm. you know, they will be formative. The best ones and the worst ones will be formative and everybody in the middle is kind of vanilla. Um, don't be like this one, be like that one. And much of that just comes with time and really understanding what they did and how they made you feel or whether good or bad. So who knows, you know, it, well, and I think we're also 
coming more to better understand that everyone you see is walking a challenging road and that people's, you know, life can be tough and there can be stuff that happens in people's lives where we don't know everything that happened for them. And so giving them some grace and, but more importantly, giving yourself grace. Well, that could, that's important too. You've talked a lot about mentorship, mm. not on here, but I've heard outside, but also culture and um, integrity. How big of a role is that in your world of, of leadership or business or just life, those things? Well, you know, cultures are going to establish themselves with you or without you. And if mm. you have, because it's going to happen, it's, it's people. People are, people are the energy and the fuel for culture. And so if you are a purpose-driven leader and you have a vision for your culture and you have cultural attributes that you want to inject into your organization, probably a pretty good idea to be intentional about that because the culture is going to develop one way or the other. Yeah, so a lack of culture is still going to drive a culture, right? Well, that's a culture. <laughs> Isn't that that's interesting? Yeah, very yeah. much so. Yeah, yeah. And so I have worked in organizations with really awesome cultures. The organization I'm working in now, I will tell you, is, is an extraordinary company. And it all goes to the leadership and the family that established that company and continues to lead We're it We're going to talk about that in just a moment. That's it's fine. an exciting one. But then I've worked in places with a highly dysfunctional culture and you know you you feel it for sure yeah. yeah we were talking earlier i'm a i am very much a believer of a culture driven company and a relationship driven company those things and it makes it a lot more fun it makes i mean if we spend most of our time at work you better make it fun and people better be engaged and and for especially in my world of customer service i can't expect great customer service from people that are unhappy so we our mantra is best place to work makes for the best place to shop. Yeah, and but that's, that's so enlightened on your part, Mark, when you think about it, it, it you don't, you, you see yourself in the customer service business. You know, I, I often wonder what, pe what business people think they're in mm -hmm. and how you identify. Like we, we talked about somebody that owns a, a hardware store and I bet you they think they're in the real estate business and not in the customer service business. You are 100% correct. <laughs> so that's, the, that's what business are you in? And yeah. if you're in the business of are you in the business of selling a, a widget or are you in the business of creating solutions for your customers? Yeah. So. Yeah. It's spoken like a, like a true mentor, entrepreneur, business leader. Um, yeah. We're in a relationship business. Yeah. hundred percent. I agree and with you. Everything else follows from that. Without that, nothing else works. So well, well said. Well, that leads us right in because I would love to get into what you're doing today. So it may, I'm sure it's more than this, but the way it looks like today, and again, we've just glossed over again, everybody can go to that other to Mark Fuel's podcast and get a lot more detail. Um, Cause there's been so many things that you've done, but we would be here for a long time if yeah, we tried to touch on, which is really exciting, but it's formative. And what I want to talk about are the things you're doing today and what brought you into it. Cause as I said earlier, it looks like there was some in, intention and, in, or it's been created that everything kind of touches in some way, shape or form that you do. So right now, the way it looks, if I understand correctly, you have a new earth project, which I'm excited for you to, I'm not even going to, I'm going to let you do everything on that new earth project. You have the U S board writers club mm -hmm. and you have fuel TV and you probably have some other stuff. What else, what else do you have going on right now? We're going to we're going to go into all three of those. What else isn't on my list? That's it. Those are the three. Yeah. Those are the three things. Um, you know, I, I have been very fortunate in my career that the places where I have worked, I have been given the freedom to navigate sort of frontier stuff. And so, you know, when I was at Prime Ticket and had an opportunity to lead our action sports, organ that part of it, the company, discovered this book called Being Digital by Nicholas Negroponte, he read it in late 1994, bought 10 copies of it for the people I loved the most in the world and said, you guys have got to read this book. The internet's this thing that's going to happen and wow. built a website for the U.S. Open of Surfing in 1995. I've had that great good fortune of being able to, in my, a lot of my jobs, 
do that stuff. And for note there, you mentioned it, but you were the driving force, if I understand correctly, behind the US Open of Surf and Huntington Beach at its heyday. Like million dollar event. I'm probably getting some stuff wrong, but that was early 80s. I was there along with a zillion other people. So do I have that almost right? Um, okay. The Correct. timing was not right. Um, so I got to Prime Ticket Network in 1990. We had a, suffered a terrible advertising recession okay. in 91, the Gulf War One, And we had, we had an obligation to the cable operators that we had deals with to put on X number of new hours of programming every week. And we didn't have any baseball in the summertime back then. We had the Lakers and the Clippers and the Kings and SC and UCLA, but there was no summertime baseball because at the time that baseball team owners thought that it would hurt the gate if they put home games on. So we didn't have that. And so we, and because we lost the, the advertising revenue, we lost the budgets for doing the Bud Tour and the AVP Pro Beach Volleyball Tour. And so the guy that was running programming, Don Corsini, who he and I are, he's one of, the most important people in my, as a friend, but also as a mentor. Um, we had started surfing together and he said, hey, we're gonna not be able to put the Bud Tour on anymore unless we can find somebody to underwrite the cost of the programming. Would you like to come work for me in programming and you can be our head of sports marketing and go out and find underwriters to cover this? And that's how I got hooked into the guys at Surfing Magazine and PT became a really good friend of mine. That's how that happened. And God. then PT said to me in 82 or 92, we need to bring the, the world tour back to the United States. It had not been to the US since 86 when the OP Pro riot happened. So we went to our big boss and convinced him that we should bring the world tour back to the US with the US Open of Surfing. And then we debuted that in the summer of 1994. Okay, you're right. I was off by 10 years there, but I was, I was there. And for a lot of those events, and they were the biggest events. I mean, it was the. It is still to this day the biggest surf event. It's still. It's going to celebrate its 30th anniversary incredible. this year. So our mutual friend Tom McElroy designed the logo for that. And I said to Tom, when we did that together in 1992, I said, if we get this right, 25 years from now, people are going to look at that and go, "Oh, that's the U.S. Open of surfing." And 30 yep. years later, it worked. Hallelujah. Well done. Okay. I told, I appreciate that. And thank you for correcting my dates, but I pulled you away from a newer project. So Super you were asking exciting. me how all of these yes. things kind of came yes. together. So it came together very organically. And I would say, um, it, it has some divine intervention in it. Um, so I was executive producing a film with Chris Morrow called for the ride, the history basically a Ken Burns style history of surfing and I was also the head of content acquisition for Fuel TV. I was part of the team that bought Fuel TV in 2016 oh. and we were going to move it to the U.S. and we were going to headquarter it here. Um, that's a longer story that that well, I, I why won't bore you with. But, but I, I did want to talk about Fuel TV because I know you're active there still. Sure. Do you want, why don't we, do you want to stay on that Right now. So Fuel TV started in 2003. It was uh, started as part of the Fox Networks group. My good friend CJ Oliveras, who had worked with me at Prime Ticket, then became Fox Sports. Oh. He went on to do Blue Torch, and then he started Fuel at Fox. And that was on the air in the U.S. for 10 years until 2013. And then they took it off the air in favor of Fox Sports 2. So that's how they changed the branding of it. But the international licensee, a guy called Fernando Figueredo from Lisbon, had kept it on the air outside the U.S. And so he and CJ got together and they acquired the intellectual property of Fuel TV from Fox in 2014. And they went about looking to bring it back to the United States. And so through a whole bunch of different things that transpired, I was part of a group that called Everyday Networks. And we were setting up a network services company to launch new television channels because of streaming television and connected TVs. The opportunity in 2016 was pretty remarkable at the, then. Yeah. And so our uh, lead financial sponsor said, I think you guys have a great plan, but you need to have a real business to operate. Go find something to buy. So we connected with Fuel Interesting. and we acquired Fuel. And in the end, we did not raise the money necessary to continue the business. And so we sold it back to Fernando in Lisbon. And that was at the end of 2016. And Fernando asked me to stay 
with him, stay on the board, and help him navigate the U.S. market. So that was my role at Fuel TV. I took a full-time operating role at the end of 2018 and was essentially looking for ways to bring Fuel back in headquarter, a lot of its sales marketing programming here in the U.S. Where is it today? It's headquartered in Lisbon still. And we, through a bunch of really good things that have happened with the channel, we've expanded distribution. We're on the air in 120 countries around the world. Wow. Uh, just launched on Amazon last week. Really? Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. So Fuel continues, at, um, you know, the global so, home so of action So we can go find it on? On Amazon. Just on search Amazon. Amazon Fuel. Yeah. You'll and it's included in your? Amazon Prime subscription. Oh, yeah. fantastic. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And it's on Sling TV. It's on a bunch. Of, and there's Fuel TV Plus, which is the subscription video on demand side of it. So, yeah, Fuel is widely available now. Outstanding. And it has stayed consistent and focused on its Action core sports. mission, which is surf, skate, snow, BMX, mountain bike. Yeah. All right. I guess I can start watching TV again, not having to get stuck watching what my wife likes, oh. which I generally don't like. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, honey. Um, so, anyway, I was working on this film, and Chris called me one day in late 2020 and said, early 2021, and said, hey, our friend PK, Peter King, has found some financing for this film, and he'd like to step on as executive producer. Do you mind stepping off? And, and I said, no, I just want to see it get made, and can we get it for fuel? And he said, I bet you, I bet you we can, is what he said. I'm like, yeah, great. Go for it. So, and what film is this? It's, well. Okay. I'll, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll tell Got you it. that story. So it was going to be called For the Ride, um, The History of Surfing in Eight Parts. Mm -hmm. That was what it was going to be, an eight-part an eight or an eight-episode series on the history of surfing. So think what Ken Burns has done, and we were going to do it in the surf world. So in the interim, I met this guy named Darren, and through Paul Gomez, actually, who introduced me to him, and we had a coffee one morning, and I filed it away under, hey, he's a really nice guy. I got him in my phone, and that's that, and didn't think another thing of it. And so I called Chris a couple of weeks later. I said, where's the film, man? He goes, oh, like, well, who's the, who's financing it? How's it working? He goes, I really can't talk about that. You need to talk to this guy named Darren. And I said, Darren who? And he said, Darren Don't. I said, wow, that's so weird. I just met with that guy for coffee. So I had his number, and I picked up the phone. I go, hey, dude, what's happening with this thing? He goes, oh, that's my client, Wes Carter at Atlantic Packaging. Oh. We have a vision for Atlantic Packaging being the most sustainable packaging company, and we think we can tell the story about the problem of plastic pollution in the ocean through surfing. I'm like, well, that's pretty cool. I love that idea. But like, I knew nothing about packaging, zero. Nor did you probably know about Atlantic I knew packaging at that time. I knew nothing, Mark. Zero. Like, I'm a complete... Yeah. That had never paid any attention to that stuff. We'll paint a picture of that in just a minute, because it's incredible. So, and he said, but Wes is actually going to be here in a few weeks, and he wants to know about the media business. You know a lot about the media business. You guys should meet up. You want to meet him? I'm like, yeah, sure, that sounds cool. I'd love to meet the guy. So I did a little bit of research and found out about Atlantic Packaging, and I found out about Wes's grandfather, who had started the company. It's, incredible it's story. It's an incredible story. Uh, again, you went into super great, beautiful detail on Fuelie's podcast. Yeah. So just suffice to say that Horace Carter took on the Ku Klux Klan and won and won the Pulitzer Prize in 1952, and that's what started the company. So you've got this commitment to doing yeah. the right thing. Love that. So I sat down and I met Wes, and I didn't know what to think, to be honest with you. Like, what is a packaging guy doing investing in a surf movie? And I met him, and I had just gotten a new Firewire surfboard the week before. It had come in nothing but plastic and bubble wrap, and it was baffling to me. I didn't know what to do with it, knew nothing. And Wes is talking about redesigning packaging for shipping surfboards and he showed me a photo of it on his phone and I sat there and I said wow man if my surfboard showed up like this I'd be really happy and unbeknownst to me Darren was filming that which he was always oh. filming it and he posted something on social media that afternoon with me saying that and I got an email that night from Mark Price who was then the CEO at Firewire yep. Surfboards he goes hey Meek what's the deal with this clandestine surfboard shipping thing I'm like whoa that's pretty fast so I s sent it to Wes, and I had his number. And so we just started talking through the course of that summer about what they were doing and how they were doing it and 
one thing led to another, and, he, and we agreed that maybe there was a role for me to play in helping him develop a new Earth project. And that, like I said, one thing led to another, and I started that November 1st of 2021. As managing, oh, really? that, okay. as, man as managing director of a new earth project. Yeah. And so we built it from there where it was an idea for a surf movie, a surfboard shipping system, and maybe some other stuff. And it has evolved to become the sustain, the sustainability initiative of Atlantic packaging, which is the largest privately held packaging company in North America. Yeah. Say that again. So Atlantic packaging. Yep is the largest privately held packaging company in North America. So we're talking big, 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 because you think of packaging these days, everything that comes to your front door, I mean, this is a big, big industry, privately held, founded way back when by Horace, Horace Carter. Carter. And then Horace turned the, the, he threw the keys across the table to his son, Rusty, in 1971 or 72 and said, I'm going fishing. Rusty took it from maybe a million dollars in sales to today it does over a billion dollars in sales. And Incredible. it's Rusty and his son, Wes, and Wes's brother, Scott. So it shows that integrity and that vision, and it also shows now this commitment to wanting to do, continue to do good, which makes me so happy. So as a, as a surf kid, I almost thought about bringing my license plate from my truck that mm -hmm. I have up in my garage from in high school, and it says, Save Our Seas. Yeah. Which today is more so much more relevant than ever before. And ironically, um, I even reached out when I heard this, when I started learning more about this, and I follow Kelly Slater. I mean, there's been a lot of names you've been throwing around, like the people at PK and PT, like these are all the who's who in surf, or mm. some of them. Yeah. They're all in your world for one, but B, now these are, there's a lot of people in surf looking for solutions to help from a grassroots or bigger level, how to improve our environment because we're the ones that experience it after every rain and every day. We're the ones that see it out in the ocean, on the beach, in marine mammals, et cetera, et cetera. So it's so, it makes me so happy to hear somebody really going after it because, and I'll loop back, we had um, Say Craig, who also goes as the trash tramp. She sat in here and she is this passionate end user trying to help educate, inform, and lead people on how to clean up trash in their world. Okay. But her frustration is that, she, and she says it on the pod, she's like, it's the people that create it that should be helping resolve this. They've, so it's, let's it's, talk about that. But she said, it's the biggest marketing p push in the world to make end users feel like they're responsible for recycling and not get any support from the, the founders. I completely agree with you. The same thing, BP did that in the oil industry, where if you remember that campaign that Ogilvy and Mather did, around calculate your own carbon footprint as an individual, that implicitly put the burden for the carbon problem on the individual instead of where it belongs, which is up in the system as opposed on the individual. We as individuals can't do anything about our carbon footprint at the end of the day. And we can have all the beach cleanups in the world and it's not going to solve the problem yeah. where the problem really has to be solved yes i think we should continue to support things like the ocean cleanup and sungai watch and and parlay for the oceans and all the people that are looking to clean up what's already there but we are dumping the equivalent of one trash truck full of plastic into the ocean every second of every minute of every hour of every day and if within 25 years it's going to be three trash trucks a second if we don't do something that's a true thing so it's where the staggering. change has to occur is in the system up the stream and i think that there were there was a blind spot maybe intentional maybe not maybe we just didn't want to talk about it but at the end of the day it is an irresponsible thing for multinational companies to be shipping problematic products and problematic packaging into parts of the world where they don't have any waste management infrastructure Yes, we see it here, but we are so lucky because we have waste management infrastructure and laws in America that actually deal with a huge part of the problem. We get some of it, but nothing like you see in Guatemala, nothing like right. you see in, in the developing world. And so I think what part of our mission at a New Earth Project, we stated mission is to rid the world's oceans, lakes, and rivers of plastic pollution. 
And what we're working on is storytelling in the outdoor industry. So surf, skate, snow, all of it, hunt, fish, creating solutions for products to be packaged and shipped in those industries. And our criteria is either curbside recyclable or backyard compostable. But really it has been, it is intended to inspire the bigger companies to pay attention. So, so thank, thank you. What, I mean, this is incredible and it's so necessary. Well, it is necessary. And I give all credit to Wes Carter and his dad and his brother, Scott, for having the vision and the commitment to provide the resources, time, people, and money to be able to tell the stories. And I know category, I know for sure it's working. We're seeing the impact it's having on existing customers. We're seeing the impact that it's having on opening doors for new customers. So and great. I want to say this, we are not, we are proudly for profit. Have to be. And, and so we are being provided with the catalytic capital to accelerate the success of the initiative to be able to help more companies make sensible transitions to more sustainable solutions. And there's twin forces at work. There's a lot of legislation that's being passed around the world under the heading of EPR. It stands for Extended Producer Responsibility, mm. where it puts the onus yes. for the end of life of a product on the, on the producer and not the consumer. Yeah, that's fantastic. So there's that. And then the other side of it is consumer demand. So younger consumers, when they are polled and they are asked about their purchase decisions, sustainability ranks right up there at the top of the consideration set that they've got when they're making a decision, a decision about what product or brand to, to support. That's so good. I mean, the pendulum has to swing, otherwise we're in big trouble. We're already, I mean, we can talk environment all day, but the, the stat that you gave, one trash truck. Every second. Every second of plastic into the, into the oceans. When you hear that type of stuff, when Say was here, she said that it was 6% of our, of our recyclable material gets recycled. 6%. Maybe 6. Maybe 6. And then she used a term that has stuck with me. And she, she used the term hope recycling. Yeah. I asked the, I'd never heard it before. I asked hope the question. Si hope cycling. Hope cycling. I'm like, I want to recycle this stuff. Where does it go? How do I do it? And she's like, most of the stuff you put in the recycling bin, you're hoping that's going to recycle. It's not. It belongs in the trash bin. Correct. And then you talk about the, what is it, the chasing arrows indicator. It's more of, this is what it's made of, not how you, re it doesn't mean it's recyclable, well, there's, right? There's a, there, so California is, has been ahead of the curve. So if you think about California, the biggest cash register in the country, yeah. America being the biggest cash register in the world. So what has goes California, so goes a lot of the country from a regulation perspective. So look at what we did with auto emissions. That is the de facto standard for the rest of right. the U.S. So in California, a couple of bills were passed, Senate Bill 54, which is the Plastic Producer Responsibility Act, so basically, or the Plastic Pollution Reduction Act and the Packaging Producer Responsibility Act, where you now are going to need to conform to a set of guidelines that are being administrated by CalRecycle, where we're going to see a fee structure imposed on problematic packaging. So that's happening. So if you make a product and sell it in California, you're gonna to need to take responsibility for the end of life of the packaging of that product. It's, it's amazing, and I wanna highlight just one example. So the other thing, you know, my day job is I run hardware stores. Yep. We sell a lot of stuff. Yep. A lot of that stuff is in packaging that is offensive to me, how bad it is, but the consumers need it, and that's the way it's provided to us, and we, can, we only can apply so much pressure. We, we're a small fish. But when you show me stuff like this, mm. so what this is is a replacement concept for, it's not a concept, this is, available. Um, this is a zip tie replacement that's fully compostable. Yeah, everything except part of the mechanism up here, but it is made from PLA, which is a, uh, ultra, is a recovered plastic. So this is meant to replace, it's called fiber strap, F-I-B-R-E-S-T-R-A-P, developed by a, a group out of Sweden using long fibers from the Scandinavian forest. And they knew that zip ties have been a problem forever. Yeah. How many have we used? And so they came up with fiber strap and we identified this through our friends at Burton. We do a lot of work with Burton snowboards. And so Mitch Ravito, who's the packaging engineer at Burton said, hey, you need to look at these guys and check them out. 
And so we are now their exclusive North American go-to-market partner, and so we're bringing this to market. But yeah, this is a fiber replacement for a zip tie. And that's just one of many examples of stuff that's coming that I want in my store so we can start to phase out that other stuff, whether it be packaging or product that is better for the environment, still accomplishes what it was built to do. Yeah. Love it. Love thank, it. Thank you. I'm going to move over to your next role, but sure. I want to, one thing I heard in your previous interview about um, a New Earth project, and I got to say, there's some great people involved, and you guys support guys like Peter King and Barton Lynch on their podcast, and just good people involved. Kelly Slater's now super passionate about it, and he does a lot of stuff on his feed of the packaging of his boards. So the Firewire surfboards thing is a really interesting case study. So mm -hmm. that was two and a half, almost three years ago that I got that note from Mark Price. And we have now developed a fully curbside recyclable packaging program for Firewire that goes all the way to their manufacturing facility in Thailand. So they have committed completely to a fiber-based uh, shipping program. And, it, and it's even down it, to the it, tape you use. It's the everything. tape, yeah, it's the whole thing. And so we feel really good about that. Rightly so. And Kelly Slater talks a lot about it. And yeah. there's a, it's just, it's wonderful. And again, at the end, we'll give where you can find out. Um, I in, highly in the recommend show, In the show notes? I don't, I don't even know how to do that. Yeah. Yet, <laughs> we'll make sure it's available. Cole, help me with that stuff. Um, let's go over to, so we're talking about the surf aspect here. There's a surf tie-in with a New Earth project. There is. But you have a real surf thing that's just as innovative and super cool that you're involved in, which is the U.S. Board, board Riders. And, yeah. And uh, can you, so give the high level, maybe what it is and the mission for it. And then we'll talk about what you've been experiencing and we'll get to what you guys just experienced this last weekend. Cause it's really, it's just amazing. I want to hear you tell the story though, before I talk. If you've been to Australia, you know about the Australian board riders clubs. They've been around in various places since the early sixties and it's about being part of a club in the community in which you grow up, and it stands for camaraderie, community, multi, uh, generational continuity, um, learning about your surf history, learning surf culture. It, they, they're, they're stalwarts, and, and Australia has really led that over the last yeah. 50 years. It never really quite took hold in the U.S., and in 2016, Casey Wheat, Ziggy Williams, and Chris Moreno started a brand called Sport of Kings, in Huntington, and they had Robbie Jeffers come down and do a photo shoot with four generations of surfers from Huntington. And Casey looked at Ziggy, looked at Chris, and said, wow, this is like the Huntington Beach Board Riders Club. And so they said, we should start one. And then Chad Wells and Mikey Riley and Seal Beach heard about it, and they said, we're gonna start the Seal Beach Board Riders, and they had one comp in 2016 at Golden West. And then the Newport guys heard about it, Laguna heard about it, and now, and Eric Diamond and Dana Point heard about it, so they started forming their own local surf clubs, and that's how West Coast Board Riders was created. And they hired Darren Brillhart, Brillo, to come and run their events for them, and it was super grassroots, kind of just for local bragging rights, but got really, it got going. And um, I met those guys, would have been the end of 2018. I was on the board at Surfing Heritage and Culture Center, and I called Brillo and I said, hey man, we wanna give away a membership to Surfing Heritage to all your board riders clubs because we need the kids. We wanna get the kids in the door. And he said, well, that's cool, man, but what are you doing right now? And I yeah. said, well, I'm back focused on surfing and I've got Fuel TV. And he goes, I'd love to introduce you to these guys. It would be great. So I went and I met them in Huntington at their spot in Pacific City. And I remember walking away thinking to myself, man, if these guys can pull this off, this will be the most important thing in American surfing in 50 years. Wow. Because we were so lost at the time. From Def Define lost. Well, you had, we had gotten away from what the heart and soul of surfing, in, in my opinion, and you know, the surf industry. It turned was, into a real sport. Well, right? it had turned into a, a, a sport, but, but it had gotten, I mean, when you, when you look back at the people that had really pioneered it and you looked at the stratification of surf and you looked at what had happened in competitive surfing with the, with the WSL, um, I felt like we were starting to lose our way. We had forgotten about the kids on the beach. 
And this was a way, f and you know, when you start to see the mentors, you start to see the older guys and the older women who had been surfing forever and who were noteworthy people. I mean, I go back to the Bud Tour days, and I don't know if you remember the Bud Tour on television, but though it was on television week in, week out, and the likes of Shane Beshin and Kelly Slater and Rob Machado, they were household names. I would go to the Lakers games with PT, and he was our play-by-play -play color guy for Prime Ticket, and it was like going somewhere with Mick Jagger. Everybody knew him. Really? And they I wanted to say, oh yeah, it was, it was a real phenomenon at the time. Wow. And, and so I thought, this is gonna be a really incredible movement if they can pull it off, and I got involved to help a little bit, and then one thing led to another, and then we lost Casey in 2020. He, yeah. he overdosed. Yeah. And the board got together and we voted to become a nonprofit. So U.S. Board Riders Clubs is a 501c3 nonprofit. And we separated it from the Brands Board of Kings, which is now doing its own thing. And we set about creating this national governing, but I mean national governing, this organizing, yeah. gentle organizing framework to help new clubs start. So you had Florida board riders started, you've got Mid-Atlantic, we've got New Jersey, now New York, New England, and Hawaii just started. We've got more than 50 clubs. That's incredible, 50 clubs in? Really five years. Five years, Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, it really is. And we just had our, our US board riders national championship presented by a New Earth project. So this is yeah. where my world's come yes. together on Fuel TV. Yes. So I was able to, it, it, it's a nice synthesis of the things that I'm, at least able to help move along. And um, San Clemente won again, but the North Shore Board Riders got second, first year club, and we're off to the races. I think we're at that moment in time where this thing is gonna go. Well, I wanna ask you why, but I gotta say that I wasn't down there. It was at Lowers last weekend, Lower Trestles. But what I watched, it looked like, it looked like the best thing ever in surf. It was all, to your point, all ages, Everybody cheering for each other, heckle fest, love fest. Um, I saw an interview with, um, I don't know if it was CJ Hobgood or I think it was CJ, but CJ. he talks about it. He's like, you have to go say hi to everybody. We're talking all these names for those of you that own surf. Like we've talked, these are a lot of famous surf names, but he was saying like, you got, everybody's here. You got to see him. You don't know when you're going to see him again, but it was like the who's who of surf, all ages, all surfing really, really well. It looked amazing. Yeah, it, and the, the surf was really good, which is a- it Always helps. <laughs> it always helps, and the weather got really good, and people were having a really good time. Um, but I would say that the commitment that we have made to community is what makes all the difference. Because surfing, competitive surfing, is a, is a, is a solo thing. You do it on your own, you're by yourself, you're competing against the other guy or the other girl. And in this case, yes, you're competing, but you're competing for your club, for your hometown. And so you've got an Encinitas board riders kid who's being coached by Rob Machado, or Taylor Knox is giving you a tip, or you know, you've got, oh my gosh, you had Cade Matson who, who missed the cut, didn't make the cut in the mid-year cut for the WSL, and he comes back from Margaret River and he serves for San Clemente yeah. board riders. I, it's just, it, it means a lot. Well, I mean, on so many levels. Think about being a kid with all those mentors and legends there, and then you get to watch them surf and you're hanging out with them, and you're, I mean, there's just so many aspects of it. Then you couple in good waves, and then you couple in being in the ocean, and there's so many parts of this, community, camaraderie, all these things. I feel like I talk about it on every podcast because it always comes back. Like that is what drives um, passion and headspace and health and wellness. It's those things, camaraderie, community, fitness, nature like that's what you've got in the board riders right you know it's incredible to be at lowers first of all california state parks i cannot say enough good oh, things good. about our california state parks um they're real treasures and anybody from california go see a state park get your annual pass yeah for sure do that um the pacific ocean is the greatest wilderness in the world and we're right on the edge of it we're in it we're competing in it and the dolphins are going by and the pelicans yeah. are going by and you're like okay, it doesn't get better. Pretty amazing, good for you. Um, you said that you feel like we're tipping, we're like tipping positively, we're like the precipice of something bigger or mm. the next 
gen or whatever. What, where do you think it goes from here? Or what does it need to go to the next level? Um, I think it needs, again, generational continuity. Um, we have done this with all volunteers. We have nickeled and dimed our way every year. We barely squeak through. All of us on the board have contributed financially to it. Um, and I think we're at that moment in time where its relevance and its authenticity have been established, where now we're at a place that we can actually put it into a position where it's gonna thrive for the long term. And so whether that's a capital campaign, whether that is additional commercial support from sponsors, we're looking at all of those things. We need to bring on a real executive director, somebody that can take it over and run it for the next 10 years. Yeah. Um, that's where we are. Well, it's interesting because I often have nonprofits and CEOs of nonprofits are often in, in here because they're doing really cool stuff and, and, and it's always the same conversation, right? It's not the, it's not the concept. It's not the vision. It's how do you pay for it, mm -hmm. right? It takes community. It takes engagement. It takes really good leadership, which takes passion and, and, and it takes, it all has to come together because the best thought concept or organization in the world when it's nonprofit will still fail without leadership and finance, right? I'll go back over 20 years and I'll tell you a quick story. So I was uh, doing some work for a federally funded healthcare initiative and my partner and I were doing it together. And we were sitting in our office one day and I said, you know what's great about the work that we do? We deal with the, in the currency of ideas. And he said, well, actually that's not true. We deal in the currency of getting things done. And I, it got heated. I said, no, man, you gotta have a good idea. He goes, dude, your mom has good ideas. He said, I'll tell you what, you take your good idea and your C minus execution team, and you take my C minus idea and my A plus execution Financing. team, oh, execution. and I will kick your ass every day of the <laughs> week. And I, and I left, I was pissed and I went home fuming like that's not true and then I'm in the shower the next morning I'm like oh, you know what he's right actually and I went back I said Jim you're right it is about execution and getting things done so you can have the greatest idea in the world but without the work and without executing and without consistent execution over time it doesn't matter we use different words but we talk about that exact same thing at work all the time yeah all the time all the time. That's super, I think it's a, and that's another great education, right? Sometimes a little tough love goes a long <laughs> way, right? Yeah. Figured out in the shower the next day. I've had plenty of those experiences. Um, well, again, kudos on all this. It's super exciting. They're both really important things um, and really exciting things. And here you are. But let me just put a bow around it. So, you know, I was doing the board riders thing when I came into a new earth project. And when I saw what we were doing in surfing, and, I'm, and I went to Wes and I said, I think there's an opportunity for us with board riders to come alongside and contribute financially to the organization mm. and become the presenting sponsor. We need to establish ourselves in surf. And so it is the US Board Riders National Championship presented by a New Earth Project. Oh, I missed that. And so, you know, I, I, I'll often joke, I'm a walking conflict of interest because all my, the parts and pieces fit together, but actually it's, I think it's one plus one plus one equals four in this case, because we have been able to leverage this ecosystem to a really good effect. Yeah. And it's been, I think, good for everybody. And, you know, in surf, this is, I will make an argument that this is the most, it, it is the most important thing in American surfing right now. Well, kudos to you for Thank being, you one of those one plus one plus one equals four, right? I mean, y you're touching on all those. Conflict or not, that's outstanding. You're the mortar between those, those bricks. So kudos to you, that's really neat. Um, you just mentioned the most important thing, but let's talk real quickly um, about your experience with the, the changes in the surf industry over the last five, 10 years, 10, 15 years. Okay. What do you see happening? It's so good to see this grassroots holistic thing kind of coming back, but the industry's changed significantly so you know when you talk about the surf industry it was a really interesting time because i was there sort of from the beginning you know in the media side of it from 1990 until today um 
And there was a point in time where surf was driving culture across the country and across the world. I remember Coca-Cola back in the late 80s, early 90s, they did a study called The Global Teenager, and they sent a bunch of graduate students out with video cameras to do interviews with teenagers and find out what drove them. And they came back, and one of the five communities that they identified were surfers. It was, a, it was an ethos. And that was partly because of the magazines, it was partly because of television, but it was because of the brands and they were cool. And you know, if you were living in St. Louis, Missouri, you'd go to the Buckle and buy a Quicksilver t-shirt and you felt cool. And so that drove a tremendous amount of value creation in the marketplace and opportunity for financial engineering. And so mm -hmm. you had companies that were founded in the surf that were now transcending that origin and now they're trading on the New York Stock Exchange and you know surf has done this over time you've had the booms and the busts and we've just gone through a, a radical restructuring if you take a look at where the, the heritage brands exist today you know you think about them they're in completely different hands yeah and so and those are just the heritage brands. you're talking quick and billabong and everything under the Billabong label and board writers and to I mean they're all Ruka <laughs> yeah, yeah all of them Volcom, Rip, Rip Curl I mean, yeah. Rip, all, yeah. Globe all, all of them that you yeah, know formed wild. it wild and these were the the brands we as growing up in the 80s surfing here that's all we wanted to be associated with yes that's all we wanted to wear right here it was all founded here um, maybe not founded here but it was you know Quicksilver Americas was here and Billabong Americas was here and Hurley was founded here and Vulcan was found here and Ruka. That's all, that was core surf back in the day. It's not anymore. I still wear it and I still know those guys, but it's just changed so much. And I don't know if we'll ever see another wave where apparel with a surf brand on it is going to drive the kind of business that it drove at the height. I mean, I remember I was, work, I was running the Action Sports Group from 2003 to 2006, which is the group of magazines that included Surfer Surfing. We put a, a, almost a million two in advertising into the big issue of Surfer in 2006. That's just an extraordinary amount of revenue yeah. to, and because that was the height of the success of those businesses and they needed to be there to advertise. I don't know if we'll ever see that again, but I will tell you this, we've never seen more people surfing than we're seeing today. And so something is gonna come out of this. Yeah. And we're feeling this energy, we're feeling this, this thing starting to build again. And I, I look at what Kolohe and the kids are doing in San Clemente with this 2% thing. And I see what Joe Alani and his brother Noah and cousin Omar are doing with couch surfing. Yep. And you start to feel it and you're like, okay, well, something's going to... And gonna... you factor 50 board riders clubs and... 50 board riders clubs. And so what's going to happen in Wrightsville Beach with Wrightsville board riders? Hey, if nothing else, they're going to be making Wrightsville Beach board riders t-shirts and selling them at Sweetwater Surf Shop in Wrightsville Beach. That's going to happen. We yeah. know what's going to happen. So it's going to be interesting That's to see. Really neat. Super neat. Well, thanks for shedding the light on all that. And I like... there's. There's the interconnection, all of it, not just you, but all of these things and all the evolution. It's just, you've, you've seen a lot of it from different sides yeah. over a lot of years. And um, it's pretty exciting. And I would have said three years ago, I, would, I wouldn't have said exciting in surf. It, w there wasn't, but this kind of, this wave of board riders is really, it is really exciting because it's a, it's a feel good, it's a good thing for community and it's ultimately a good thing for surf. So it's really, a great thing. And I'll tell you too, I don't, lose sight of what's happening with the wave parks. It's a good because point. Because I think we'll start to see a board riders club at least pop Palm up. Palm Springs and, and well, yeah, right. yeah, I think that's going to happen because it's, it's a, it's a, a, it's a culture thing. Yeah. Well, that North Shore movie is coming to fruition, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And Rick Kane. Rick or Kane. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, Don, we could go all day and I love all, I love all this. Newport's finest. I'm glad they're doing their job. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, Don, so you've got a lot going on. You still look very young, and you told me of something. You look young because you act young and you're fit. You mentioned to me something that you have a, a goal, a goal related to a pretty good feat of physical fitness. 
What did you just mention to me earlier today that you'd like oh, to do? Oh, I'm going to go on the record with this, aren't I? Only if you want to. I do. I do. So I, I, so I wrote down a long time ago, always stay fit to play. I always, if somebody goes, hey, let's go mountain biking, you're not like, oh, man, I'm not in shape to go mountain biking, or let's go surfing, I'm not in shape to go surfing. Because there were times in my life where I was not fit to play. Mm. And I was telling you earlier that I have on my list Catalina on a paddleboard, the Catalina channel I would like to... I would like to do that. And you said that there's a race coming up in September for the Ben Carlson Memorial. And I'm this yes. close to saying yes. yes. I'm not going to pin you down, but I would love to get you out there to do it. Again, it's one of my passions is to get people to cross that channel paddle. Because once you've done it, again, you've looked at that island for the better part of your life. Once you've paddled that channel, A, there's something about that accomplishment. B, there's something about that body of water. But when you can sit here, you come back and you look at that island, you're like, you just never look at it again. When you fly over it, you're like, that's a long way. It's magic. So I need to send Joe Bark a text and say, I need a 14-foot commander. Is that the one? Something like that. Okay. Yeah, we can talk off. But I would be excited for you to do that. I think you'd be stoked. As a surfer, as an ex-lifeguard, as a water person, it, it's a huge thing to add to your list of accomplishments, in my opinion. So it'd be fun to help you get across. Thank you. You wouldn't need much help. Next five years. Okay. What do you got? What do you, where do you hope to be doing more of the same? Yeah, I want to. I, I, I'm, I'm going to do this until I'm done. I, yes, this is it. I figured out that all of these parts and pieces fit together in a really unique way. Um, I have never felt more passion for my work than I do. Hallelujah. Today, good for you. Um, and I see that we've got an opportunity to. I'm going to. I'm going to share something. I really believe that this plastic pollution crisis that we're facing is a massive opportunity. Um, it's really bad. It's very serious, and we need to do something about it. It's also really visible. So for the people that are listening to this, if you've gotten this far, I recommend that you go listen to a guy called Daniel Schmachtenberger. He is one of the greatest public intellectuals of our age. And he talks about something called the metacrisis, this collection of catastrophic risks that we face as a global society. You know, up until 1945, risk was largely confined to, they were local risks, fire, flood, famine. There was nothing that was going to affect the globe. Well, after 1945, when we dropped the nuclear bombs in Japan, now we are in an era of global risk where a nuclear war could annihilate the planet. And so over time, what's happened is this collection of risks has only accelerated. So we're living outside of our planetary boundaries with this take, make, waste, extractive economy that we live in. This is why we're driving toward these more circular solutions. And the plastic pollution crisis is probably the most visible. It's really hard to visualize climate. It's really hard to know about nuclear proliferation. It's really hard to talk about AI. Does anybody really know? Yeah. They're all risks. But the plastic pollution crisis is real and tangible. And through COVID, we all saw it coming into our homes. I mean, everybody saw the problem. We know we have solutions that if we deploy them today, by 2040, we can reduce the problem by 80%. Well, it's going to take all of us working together. Radical collaboration is going to be required if we're going to tackle this thing. And when we do start to tackle it, it's going to become visible to people. We're going to see the amount of plastic being released into the world is going to reduce. And we're going to start to see it, the impact lessen on our beaches. And can this be the framework and the example for solving some of these other big challenges that we have in the world that are going to also require radical collaboration? So I'm ending this on a note of hope that over the next 10 years, for me, I would like to be part of figuring this out as a way of addressing these other things that if we don't do it together as one human family in the in service to life, then the future could be very different. Don, what a great message. I mean, scary, but I think it's a super relevant, strong statement of what it's going to take to get where we need to get together. And just like board riders or anything else, none of this happens on your own. It requires community and engagement and leadership and passion and determination. And I'm super stoked to hear that you're staying in it because what you guys are doing at New Earth Project and at Atlantic Packaging is really going to help 
set the stage for what is doable and what it's going to take to get there. So thank you for that message. That was a really good one. Don, where else, where can we find more information about you if people want to find more about you or about the organizations that you're representing? Um, I, I'm on LinkedIn, so you can find me there. Um, I, I love LinkedIn. It's a great place to talk about what we're doing and share inspirational information with, with folks. Um, anewearthproject.com is another place to find us. AtlanticPKG.com. Um, US Board Rider or USBRC.org. You can find out more about us there. Your and email signature is robust. No, buddy. I'm going <laughs> to. Yeah, I, I know exactly. But I do hope that all of these parts and pieces make sense together and that over time they all form a, a more robust platform for us to share a message of, of hope and inspiration. Well, I appreciate you sharing it all with. I, I think it connects very well. And I appreciate us moving quickly through your life and connecting the dots. It's super cool. And I, I guarantee there's a lot of people out there that, oh, I didn't know he was a lifeguard. Oh, I didn't like, that's what this is all about. But really for you or for me, this last piece is the one of hope and aspiration. And um, it's gonna, again, it's gonna require community to get there. So thanks for being a leader in that space. Oh, it's an honor. Thanks, okay. Mark. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.